This afternoon with us for the panel, we have on my left, Robin Smalley, who is the co-founder and director of Mothers to Mothers International. Next to her, Dr. Yakubi, who is the founder and executive director of the Afghanistan Institute of Learning, or AIL. Next to her, Hendrina Daroba, who is the executive director of the Forum for African Women Educationalists, referred to as FAWE. And lastly, we have Mr. Roy Prosterman, who is the founder of Landessa. Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's an honor to have you here and to hear and soak up a little bit of your wisdom. So the first question I have is general, so feel free to jump in as needed. As Neela mentioned when opening today, um, the notion of women and girls and female empowerment is not an isolated or a third world problem. It's an issue about which many women in the room are extremely dedicated and passionate. So I'm wondering how we as students and educators in the United States can work to forward the education and empowerment of women in our own backyard. I guess I can start. I mean, at Mothers to Mothers, we really only work in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, however, I'm very well aware that many of the issues around education and empowerment of women are universal. Um, that was brought home to me really a couple of years ago where I had a very interesting meeting with a Senator Burr in DC who started quoting me statistics about maternal and child health in, in rural Appalachia. And the numbers that he was quoting to me, he could have been talking about Malawi. And I was truly horrified. And in fact, in two weeks, I'm going to meet uh, with the, the head of the health department in Baltimore. Because in fact, we're finding that a lot of the problems that we have in the states, although we don't have uh, uh, prevention of mother to child transmission of HIV issues, we basically have eradicated pediatric AIDS in this country, we have huge issues relating to women's disempowerment. Um, as it regards to violence, as it regards to education across the board. And it was interesting to me that you know, a city like Baltimore is now turning to a program in sub-Saharan Africa um, to look at ways that we have found to empower women because truly the problems are not as dissimilar as we might think. Um, for me, uh, it's very interesting coming from Afghanistan. Uh, when I was doing my master's degree in Loma Linda University, so I was doing my um, uh, master's degree paper, I went to Georgia um, uh, State, uh, state of Georgia, uh, in downtown area. I went to do the paper, and I went to the Salam area. And the things that I saw there, uh, um, women uh, being abused and children being malnourished, and um, uh, poverty, it shocked me because I thought only Afghanistan is that the women are violated, beaten. Over there in that um, sort of a very salam area, I saw a woman was beating up, bruised all over, and um, uh, children all around her, five, six children, not only one child, and they are malnourished, and the environment was so dirty, and so, uh, I mean, something that I, uh, coming from Afghanistan for me, I never could imagine that something like that could be happening in the United States. So for me, that's always when people talk about Afghanistan and about the violation against women in Afghanistan, it's just that bell ring in my ear that, you know, uh, this is not only in Afghanistan, it's a global issue that everywhere in the world they have this problem. So that's for me is something that I think as a, a young people, all of us and as old people should know that this is just something that we really need to empower women and that's very important to do. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, for me, I'm coming from Africa and uh, I think what I would like to say is that um, much as an African woman is suffering, an American woman is suffering. The degree of suffering may be different and sometimes we're better off because we talk about the, our issues. But maybe for an American woman, you, you may not be able to articulate what the issues are or the kind of suffering that you are going through. Mm -hmm. So my request really, especially to the youth, is create that opportunity. Speak about the problem. The problem will be half solved. Because the more you bring it down, mm -hmm. the more you create other problems. And I think we have an opportunity in our backyards to talk about those issues. Mm -hmm. We have an opportunity to make reference to those that have talked about it, and it makes a difference. And I encourage you to do the same. We uh, at Landessa work on issues of land rights for the rural poor. 
around the world and uh, have a special focus on women's land rights uh, in developing countries. And I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk more about that, but it, it is very interesting when you think about it, ways in which lessons from developing countries as to empowerment of women through land rights and associated measures can also be brought to bear in developed country uh, settings. Uh, more attention, for example, I think can be paid to uh, regimes of community property and ways in which that specifically empowers women. Uh, certainly property rights in developing countries make a huge difference. Uh, no reason why they shouldn't make an equivalent or nearly equivalent difference in developed country settings. Or another basic lesson so important to teach people what their legal rights are. Uh, a right that's not known is not really a right at all. Mm -hmm. and in many developing country settings, one of the first things that needs to be done in empowering women, uh, especially with respect to property, but in a, a lot of other areas as well, is to provide information and teaching as to what their rights are under the law uh, a good deal along those lines could probably be done profitably in the United States and other developed country settings. Thank you very much. The next question is for Dr. Yakubi specifically. I'm wondering, in your work in communities where women and female empower empowerment isn't necessarily, necessarily a priority and is oftentimes uh, discouraged, how do you and your organization work to combat those issues while still having the community buy-in and a productive and safe learning environment for the women and girls? Thank you very much. Uh, as all of you know, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, it has been a war for 40 <coughs> years, almost there is a war, internal war. And during this time, um, uh, women, especially, specifically women and girls, have been like targeted, and they are the one who really have been violated. They are the one who really have been stopped from any kind of learning, any kind of activity, especially in area of education, especially in area of getting outside the house. And um, this has been something that if they were caught, they will be killed right on the spot. And so it is not a, something that we can really easily talk about it. All of you know, and I know that being there, that it is a huge challenge for the women and girls in Afghanistan. But how we come around that and how uh, we empower women in that kind of condition? Uh, first of all, I think that is something that uh, we need to build a trust between the community and between the people who provide service. This is one thing that we learned through our work, that once we build a trust between the community, then we will be able to uh, implement program. And second thing is that we learned that uh, what we do we don't go and just say we want to do this to empower you. We listen to them what's their need and how we can um, accomplish a service that they really needed. And so listen to them. Uh, it's not that we know everything. They know, but we have to listen to them. And the third thing is that we learn that uh, once you promise, you deliver that. And when you say, well, we do this work program, then deliver it. Don't postpone it. Don't delay it. And so this issue has become a very, very important, like sort of a tool for us to really use to empowering women. And also the most important things we find out that um, when you really want to empower women, especially a woman that for, for a decade, they have not been able to speak out and they have not been able to um, really uh, have a confidence and they have not been able to support themselves or uh, not being able to learn anything. So how you deal with those kind of uh, uh, group of women to really give them the floor, to really um, they let their creativity to be on the ground and then from their creativity and uh, through facilitation bring the, up the mm, uh, important issue that they work. And so through that, we have been able, and the first also, that provide a security, that when they come to a center, 
make sure that they are secure, that somebody else not coming and attacking them. So this has been also the most important things. So through this issue, we have been working and we brought women to be educated. We brought women to uh, be able to hold a job. We brought women to be a leader. We brought women to be in a political arena. We brought women to be a, um, a governor of a, um, a state. And so today, when you talk to the women of Afghanistan, you hear a lot about the women of Afghanistan that they are not capable or they are submissive of, they are really or not really um, having a status in their life. That is not true. In a very short term, let's say in 20 years that we have been working, the lifestyle of the women of Afghanistan has tremendously changed. Today, they are not the same women that they have been 20 years. Today, they are very uh, uh, self-confident. They have a job, and they are holding their head up, and they are looking for the future of Afghanistan. And, but all has been done through working with the community, listening to the community, and really providing the service that they need. And that is, we learn through that. Thank you. Beautifully put. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Prosterman, I'm hoping that you can talk a little bit to us about Landessa's role. When I think of land rights issues, I don't necessarily jump to women and girls. And so I'm wondering why specifically these rural land rights are important for women. Well, land rights uh, turn out to be empowering in a variety of ways and at, at a very macro level. While women certainly do at least half of the agricultural work on the planet, uh, the amount of land on which they have land rights uh, tends, depending on the country setting, to be anywhere from 20% on down and more normally down than up, uh, usually around 5 to 10%. Uh, what happens, we've found, we've worked in more than 50 countries and uh, in a number of countries have promoted programs uh, that would provide women with land rights. In India, for example, I don't know how many of you may have heard the excellent uh, lunchtime presentation uh, by uh, Kathy Spahn, the uh, uh, CEO of this year's Kravis Prize uh, winner, the Helen Keller International uh, NGO. But she spoke very persuasively about their findings as to what could be done to improve nutrition, especially child nutrition, and prevent blindness and other health impact uh, of, of inadequate vitamin A intake by utilizing house and garden plots or micro plots. And the next step in that is also to recognize that there are many families that don't even have a micro plot on which they can then be helped or taught to produce uh, vitamin A rich vegetables and fruit. In India, for example, there are an estimated 20 million rural households, about 100 million people who don't have any land at all. They're essentially agricultural laborers, and they live in a shack provided perhaps by the landowner, or they live with a relative. They have no uh, homestead plot of their own. What happens when you give homestead land to such a family and use the leverage of that conferred benefit to require that the woman's name be on the pata, be on the title, either uh, jointly or where interviewing suggests that it's culturally allowable to have the woman's name solely uh, on the title. What you find is, is women then producing both a variety of nutritious foods, uh, which uh, help greatly in child nutrition, uh, prevention of blindness and, and a number of other physical problems, uh, but also that women earn income from sale of the surplus. And Kathy mentioned this too. Well, once you've got the land, sell the surplus, and one of the first things they do with it is educate their children, girl children as well as boy children. And they are able to, for example, afford basic health care that they weren't able to afford before. 
there are just a whole long list of benefits that research has shown come from women having control over a piece of land, which generally means having her name on the title document, either jointly uh, or, or individually. And, and some of it, you know, we may get to measurement issues, I know you did with the first panel, some of the things, uh, interestingly, uh, much less spousal abuse when a woman's name is on the title, and many forms of increased empowerment within the household in terms of discussions as to who will go to school or what will we plant on the land. Uh, the, the woman, for the first time, is able to make her voice heard. Uh, so I, I could go down a long list, and my typical time frame is 50 minutes, but I won't do that. <laughs> well, thank you for that brief but very informative answer. <laughs> The next question is specifically for Hendrina. I'm wondering, in the last panel, we heard a lot about the power of youth and, and how we need to instill a lot of these leadership characteristics in them at an early age. So I'm wondering how Fawe draws the distinction between its services for girls versus the more generally broadly defined youth. So what are the specific challenges facing these girls? Thank you. Um, I want to start by saying, in terms of focus, it's very clear. Our focus are the girls. When the organization was being created, there was one agenda, ensuring that girls are given the opportunity to learn as much as the boys. So we have no apology to make on that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I mean, statistics, the recent uh, global monitoring report does show that we are making progress, but we haven't done much. And so we still continue to focus on girls. However, we also need to recognize that our organization has been in existence for about 21 years now. And throughout our lifetime, we've also learned something. That just focusing on girls alone will not resolve the issues. Knowing the issues that affect girls, knowing the things that make the girls not to perform well or not to have access to education. So throughout the years, we've actually changed our approach instead of just targeting or focusing on the girls are, uh, alone, we've brought on the boys, we've brought on the youth. Because the girls are part of the youth. If we want to resolve issues of the youth, we have to resolve the issues of the girls. And so if we have to resolve the issues of the girls, we need to resolve the issues of the youth. However, our priority still remains the girls. And we remain to focus on the girls. Why am I saying that? Because for a girl does not live in an island. A girl lives in a community. The issues that affect the girl for not going to school, some of them are social cultural issues, which comes about as a result of the interaction with the various youth, which comes about as a result of interaction with, with at family level, at community level, and so on. So in addressing those issues, we cannot just pick out the girl and deal with the girl and forget about the others. We need to take a holistic approach. And this is why even in our inter interventions, we've actually taken that approach of saying, this is just one individual, and one individual cannot change. We need to look at the various factors that actually impinge on this girl from accessing quality, quality learning. And so we have developed models that actually address not only the girl, but addresses the youth, that addresses the policy issues, that addresses the environment in which the girl is learning, but also addresses the the teacher who is actually delivering the, the, the lesson. So we've taken that holistic approach, knowing the girl is part of the youth, is part of the community, is part of the world. In terms of the issues which affect, there are so many. In an African context, of course, one of the key challenges that we have is this, the social cultural um, socialization that the girl goes through. Because of the way we are being socialized, the, the level of self-esteem, of course, is very, very low. To, to an extent that even when I'm in a maths class and I want to give a maths lesson because that, that I'm so passionate about that. Because I, everybody thinks I cannot do maths, even when the teacher is teaching, I don't get that zeal to say or that confidence to say I can take mathematics. So how do we make such a girl to actually learn mathematics in an environment where, uh, sorry to say, but it's been taught by a, 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 a male student or a male teacher? who, in his own context, believes the girl can never do mathematics. 
So really we have to address issues from a holistic perspective, knowing our target group, but also recognizing that we cannot resolve the issues on our own. We need to bring in the other aspects as well. When you talk about um, issues to do with choices at family level, again, poverty comes in. The girl may not have a choice. If a family has to choose as to who goes to school between a boy and a girl, the priority will be given to a boy. The reason being society accepts or appreciates the, the, the boy because they think the boy is going to remain in the household and is going to contribute. The girl is going to be married off and another family is going to benefit. So why invest in that girl? Let's invest in the boy because the boy is going to, to, to give back to the, to the family. Is that correct? Not at all. So really, there are so many issues out there, but we need to take a holistic approach in addressing those issues. And this is why our interventions are holistic in nature. Thank you. You mm. talked specifically about um, what relates directly to the next question, and that's kind of the power of your network and your community and having to rely on the strength of your community. Mm -hmm. And this is a question for the whole panel, but I'd like to start with Robin. Because we've essentially decided that this issue of women and girl empowerment is ubiquitous. I'm wondering how we can connect our efforts individually, your efforts as Kravis Prize recipients, um, because it seems we have this virtual network across the globe. So how can we understand and connect the work that Landessa is doing in India to the work that Mothers to Mothers is doing in Sub-Saharan Africa? How can um, all of these projects that are different in nature but really connect to the same issues, how can we connect those? Well, I'm thinking back to the last panel and all the, the similarities that we saw there. And I think all of us, mm -hmm. by the same turn, when it comes to um, empowering and educating women, are dealing with many of the same issues. And so in, in uh, the last day, we've been <coughs> talking a lot about how we can support one another's um, work. You know, when, when you talk about Lindessa, you know, I think about the women of Swaziland who, if they test HIV positive, even though they've received, they've gotten the virus from their husbands, they're the one that get kicked off the land. They're the one who lose their own property, even if it's their property. They're the ones who lose their children. Um, and have to walk away. And so, you know, the issues of land rights certainly are prevalent, but I think really the umbrella that we're all dealing with is this notion of empowerment. And I think empowerment is a term that is used very loosely without thought to what exactly does that mean. And I think for us, it means, it means paying a woman, employing her, professionalizing her, making her a role model in her village, making her the go-to person when it comes to uh, you know, questions about health and family and livelihood um, in her township. Um, by example, I find our mentor mothers really changed the paradigm, the social paradigm in villages and communities because she might be the only one with a job, including the men. Um, in her village, and and so that's what changes her, and and her gives her the courage to be proactive. I met um, a couple of weeks ago this amazing woman, uh, Juliet, in Uganda, and Juliet is, well, I think she's maybe 25, 26 years old, and had already lost two babies to AIDS, and was afraid to tell anybody in her family or anybody that she was positive. And Mothers to Mothers came to her community, and she was empowered through employment, and got up and went on the local radio show, and came out on radio to her family, to her community, and was, you know, she, she cried as she told me that all the women that came up to her afterwards and confessed that they had been living in secrecy and now all got together to go seek care for themselves and their family. I mean, that's courage. That's what empowerment is. You know, empowerment is the, the, the village in, in, in KwaZulu-Natal, KZN, you know, where I went a few years ago and I saw great excitement. All the women were outside opening boxes. And I said, what is this? And they're opening boxes of female condoms. I said, who uses female condoms? You know, what is that about? Well, they're teaching their young daughters to put them in before they go to school in the morning in case they get raped that day. They shouldn't get pregnant. That's empowerment. Um, we don't understand sometimes what that word really means, you know, when it comes to the individual woman and the individual daughter. And I think those are the things, the similarities that we're all 
dealing with and that we can help support one another with. And, and, you know, empowerment is professionalizing, is education, um, is, is, is supporting women and girls as the ones that really do lead the family and change lives and change the community as one family at a time. Well, um, I would like to share um, a story with you also about the women empowerment. Um, I was working in one village in Afghanistan, and uh, this woman was about 25 years old, and uh, she knew about our center in that area that we are teaching women how to learn, how to read and write, and how to think, and how to get involved in the community. And she really wanted to go there, but her family, her in-law, did not want her to go there. And she really fought for this, that to go there in that uh, center. And uh, the family said, in one condition, you can go, that if you get up in four in the morning and take care of all you are sure in the house, and then you can go. And this woman accept this. And I just want to tell you that, because for me, every time I see this woman, it's just tears comes in my eyes, because this woman, when she came, to the center, she, she could not talk. She was holding a chador like this. And she, even when I go there, she cover herself. As a woman, I, I could not see her. She was so shy. But do you know that she was so much talented that she came to that center and four months and a half, she learned how to read and write. And not only she learned how to read and write, she took her chador and she just, with the scarf, she come to the center. Not only that, she come to the center with that way, then she went from the reading and writing class to the income generation class, and she learned how to sew. And in a matter of six months, this lady, this girl, this woman, learned how to read and write. Not only that, learned how to be a, um, somebody who really earn an income. She learned how to sew, and she goes at night, and she at her home, she take the sewing, uh, the sewing machine, and she sew, and then she earned the money, gave it to her sister-in-law to take care of her kids in the morning, and she come back again. To make the long story short that how much empowerment is important, this woman in three years finished sixth grade education, got a certificate, become the head of our um, uh, midwife uh, uh, post, um, uh, post uh, health post. She became the head of the health post. And she opened another center. She became the manager of this center. And when we go there to monitor, the man goes with me. Now she doesn't have to really even cover from the men either. And she talk non-stop. And she tell me, and she hold this, uh, this uh, um, telephone because we have a mobile letter said that we give them to do taxing. And she hold this phone and she said, you know, I am right now the leader of this community. And I asked her why, how. She said, they respect me. They come and they ask me a lot of advice. I am, and although she is very young woman, which there is sometimes that a older of the lead, uh, uh, a woman could be uh, sort of in the um, village as a leader. But this woman is only 25, 26 years old. And she now become a leader. Everybody come ask advice. So she is empowered. She right now, her husband see the money. She bring a huge income to the house, to the in-law. And so she is empowered. Through this, you could see that the woman, if you give them a space, you give them a, an education, you give them a um, health um, you know, uh, service, and they become healthier, stronger, and they could do so much. And also learning health education to not have too many children. These are the issues that really empower women. As um, she said, it's not only just looking women as a one issue of violence or one issue is not that they are not educated. You must look at the whole cycle to see all these things could empower this woman through her life, life skill that she can really learn how to be herself how to be able to run her life, how to manage her family, how to manage her society. And that's we will try to teach them through this process. And that's it. Thank you. Well, I, I would like to, to summarize and say education is a tool to empowerment, yeah. particularly educating a girl or a woman. Mm -hmm. Where if you educate a woman, you educate the whole nation, as mm -hmm. it is always said. Yeah. At family <laughs> level, the issues we are talking about health, the issues we are talking about economic empowerment, if a woman in that home is educated, 
the lifestyle changes. Completely. And I think you need to help us to spread that good news that it is important to educate a girl. And we don't just want to go to school, we want to receive quality education. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, this is all the time we have for the panel, but I believe we have about 25 minutes for questions. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. <laughs> oh, excuse me, 10 minutes. So we'll be passing around the microphone if you have a question. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, one of the things that I really like about this panel in this setting is that we learn so much from you guys, from your stories and from your information experiences and, and analysis. Um, but one of the things that we miss is your experience being here and how you guys communicate together. Um, and one of the things I would like to ask is, what is something that you guys have learned from each other, from your time here, or hope to learn from each other, and how that will further your mission? Thank you. You want to go? Sure. Um, it's a really good question, and it's one that we spent an hour with this morning talking with your new president about. Um, and I'm very happy to say that, that he is very committed to the university finding ways to um, make stronger alliances, not only between us, but between us and the university and the Kravis Institute. So that's all really good news. Um, I think in the last 24 hours, we have, we've come up with a lot of potential collaborations. Um, you know, our challenge, as we said to him, is you know, it's easy to come up with a great idea. It's harder to fund it. Um, and so we are, we are hoping that uh, with his support and with continued dialogue, we will find ways to actually find concrete ways to support some of our collaborations that we could see going forward. Because this is, I mean, I, you guys, this is an incredible incredible group. Um, I, I just sort of am in awe that I get to sit with them all. And um, I think really great things could be done as a result of what this university has done in creating these alliances. And maybe let me just add, for me, um, I think having had this interaction really opens up my mind. Uh, when I was coming here, I was like, well, Fawe is a Kravis winner and all. Uh, and I thought we knew it all. <laughs> <laughs> but listening to my colleagues and uh, you know some of the strategies that they are using and so on, I'm like, wait a minute. Are we sure we are the best? <laughs> you know? So there's a lot of learning that has taken place. And like she said, we are picking that up. We'll continue the conversations so that we build and strengthen our models. So that's, that has been a great experience on my part. Just briefly uh, to say something that several people in the room here already know, and that is that Landessa has summer interns each year. We've had interns uh, for the last several years from Claremont and been absolutely delighted with them. Uh, and we're going to keep our eyes open for additional possibilities. And. I want to just add this. Um, the collaboration between us, we really want to continue to do collaboration, but also it depends on new students of CMA. Because if you guys also have an interest, you want to come, so you are, we are open to you to you come. But uh, we need, as she said, the resource. And I hope that the university provide that resource that you guys can come and we learn from you. Because, you know, as Johan said, we learn. We are in this field. We are every day we are learning. And we learn from you. You learn from us. So we need this interaction between the students and us also. So it would be good to see if you also have some input with the university to really make this effort to go on. Yes. Thank you. Any additional responses from our previous panelists? was about um, how you all can work together and how are you learning from each other? I think uh, we're starting to identify the way we can complement each other, potentiate each other. But of course, for doing something new, we need the time, the funds uh, to, to start working together. But we definitely, every time we meet, we start saying, you know, if we could only get together, 
Pratama Escuela Nueva, you know, uh, many of the aspects of Pratama I would love to bring to Latin America, and also uh, many things that we have designed in their hands could really potentiate each other. So I just, since it's something new, uh, it requires a little bit more of time, of funding, like Robin mentioned. So, but we, we're just, you know, so delighted to see the potential of, of really having this future collaboration among us. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll ask a quick question. I'm, I'm just curious how much time each of you spend on fundraising versus the, <laughs> the mission of the organization. I, I suspect that it, it might be lost on some of the students, like what a burden that is for um, leaders of nonprofit organizations and how, in many cases, executive directors really need to be full-time fundraisers. Um, I would like to answer this uh, question, if me. Um, I think that uh, one thing that we as a head of the organization, I personally will say that I prefer to spend most of my time inside Afghanistan and, uh, and be with the program. Unfortunately, 40% of my time is in uh, just looking for fun. I'm on the air or I'm somewhere else. And that is really creating a lot of problem. And the reason is that we are doing that because program is so wonderful and is reaching so many people. And we could not afford to not having sufficient fun to continue our work. So, and being scared and always in, on edge, so you constantly you keep running from one place to the next place. And you don't even um, really uh, feel your tiredness or ex uh, exhaustion or whatever, because you know that if you just, in, in a moment, you were not really doing what you're supposed to do, somebody is, will not be able to eat, or somebody will not see a doctor, or somebody will not go to school, or somebody will not uh, get a um, um, sufficient salary to support his family or her family. So it's, these are all the things that is in our mind. So we constantly are in edge. And so that's... I might add that th this actually is one area <coughs> where collaboration, I think, has already produced some important results for you have a brilliant fundraising operation at Claremont, and we've benefited from education mm -hmm. about what, what we need to look at, and quite right, we, you don't want folks like the ones uh, who've sat at the two tables here um, be the ones who are spending their time fundraising. Uh, I mean, there are other things where we have probably comparative advantage and should be spending our time directly on program to as, as great an extent as possible. But that said, it, it, I think we're, I'm persuaded, I think we're probably all persuaded that we do have to spend adequate amounts on fundraising, but we, we need professionals within our organizations who can take at least a good part of the burden of fundraising uh, from us, who are better at it actually than we are, and who, who with uh, much less opportunity cost can re help raise the needed, uh, the needed funds. Fundraising is, is always the elephant in the room because it's an absolutely necessary evil. We can't do anything without it, and yet no funder wants to fund it. And, and that's why it so often falls to the founders to have to do it, because we're the ones that will work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, when nobody else will. And, and you know, <laughs> over the past years, I've so often you know, had people say, you know, you love being you know, doing program stuff. Why aren't you doing that? And, and I say, because 700 children are dying every day unnecessarily of HIV. Who's going to raise the money? You know, um, if not me, who? And so I think most of us have a sense of urgency about our missions. And um, so funders need to be educated. You know, that's, you know, I think that's, we've also spent a lot of time talking about funders don't want to fund operating costs. They don't want to fund fundraising salaries. And so, um, and yet they expect you to do everything, you know, 
It's mm -hmm. like how do you run a program without a telephone, you know, mm -hmm. or paying a salary, you know? So it's it's a it's a really good question. And as you all go out into the world and hopefully make your marks and you know become phil philanthropists, I hope you remember um, that nobody expects to run a good business uh, without without income. That's all the time we have for today. Please join me in thanking both this panel and the previous panel so much for your wisdom.